you're stuck with me today, uh, so I'm sorry about that. But uh, I pray for Pastor and, and Cheryl as they're away for a few days just to relax and, and recuperate. Uh, they need some rest uh, just like all the rest of us do. We've got an exciting day today. We've got a testimony from a friend of mine that I've known since he was a 20-year-old break dancer. <laughs> I don't know if he's going to bust any moves today while he's uh, giving a report. Um, but Lee Carter uh, from the Dominican is here. His wife, Heather, is here. His mom, Lucy, is here. Uh, and uh, their daughter, Bethany, uh, is uh, not feeling real well today. She's due to have a baby in May, so she's taking it easy uh, this morning, uh, getting some rest. Uh, but they are here with us. We're glad to have you here with us. I've known them so long. My daughter, Brittany, who's right here, who is a mom on her own now, was supposed to be the flower girl in their wedding. <laughs> Except another daughter of ours was born on the same day, so we had to make other plans. Uh, so one of our daughters shares the anniversary of the Carters. Uh, but it's great to have the Carters here. Uh, they were here for a few years uh, here in our church. Um, and then they were in Decatur, uh, down at Decatur Baptist, down there with Doug Ripley for a few years. Uh, and then now they've been in the Dominican for how long now? Just under two years. So Lee, how about come give us a report of all that's going on in the Dominican. Give him a, a warm welcome. <laughs> Love you, buddy. Love you, too. <laughs> I don't want to give a report after that worship service. I just want to preach. Man, the name of Jesus, amen? Man, let's just shout that out. Jesus. He is the king of kings. He is the conqueror. He defeated the grave. The grave couldn't hold him. He resurrected. And then he walked around on earth. And then he ascended, amen? That's power. He is power. And so I want to start this morning real quick. I have to do it. I have to start in the Word. There's no better place to be than in Jesus, and he is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh, dwelt among us, we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He, he is who we are taking everywhere we go. Right now we have the blessing to be in the Dominican Republic. Amen? In the Bible, Paul came back and gave reports as to what God was doing through him. And so we're here today, blessed beyond measure, and enjoying the opportunity to give you a report of what God is doing through you in the Dominican Republic. Because we're only able to stay because of prayers, <laughs> love, and support. Amen? Thank you for your faithfulness. So, Dominican Republic. The left side, Haiti, right side, Dominican Republic. Haiti is in turmoil. It's a mess. It's a very dangerous place to be right now. The Dominican Republic is, uh, is uh, organized in their own mind. <laughs> okay. So, that's, that's where we're at. They're in Santo Domingo. Santo Domingo is at the most five miles tall, six miles wide, and we have four and a half million new friends there. It's a lot of people in that area, right? A lot of cars and a lot of motorcycles, right? They drive in the lanes and in between the lanes, and they make up their own lanes, right? Um, on a busy traffic day, I literally have sat in a car for over an hour to go a mile before. Right? I don't do that no more. I just get out and walk, right? If it's a mile, so. This is Valiente. Valiente is the first place where God told us to plant a church. It's 45 mile, or 45 minutes outside of Santo Domingo. And there's roughly 25 to 30,000 people. 
that live in that area that you're looking at right there. Okay? Where the number one is, you, it's probably hard to read because it's in red. I apologize for that. But where the number one is is where we have planted a church at this point. We meet on Wednesdays at 5.30 and Sundays at 5.30. The gathering varies. It can be anywhere from two people if it's raining to 40 people, and that's the adults, okay? And so we're, we're whether inhibited or blessed, it, we have no building. So the weather dictates a lot. It's funny, the first time it started just dumping on us in the middle of service, there's 12 of us there, and we all jumped into a house that was right next to us. And they had never been to our church, <laughs> which I loved, but, you know, <laughs> I said, welcome to church, you know. <laughs> but, uh, and, and honestly, they're very faithful in the church now. So it was really cool the way God did that. Um, so on your left right there, that's a, just a picture of one of the services we had. That's actually when there was a team with us from the United States, from Alabama. Randy Copeland's the pastor. And. They were with us in that service, but that's just a little snippet of the area of where we're meeting. On the right, there's a gang who received Christ, the majority of them. We were driving out one night, headed out. There was about 17, 18 young men walking together. I stopped the car, and uh, Johnny was with me that night. It was Johnny, myself, and Heather. I'm hopping out. Johnny goes, you know that's a gang, right? I said, yep, let's go. So... The guy on the right accepted Christ that night. He's the only one that did. Everyone else said no that night. But they said, will you come teach us more? I said, sure. When do you want me to come? New Year's Day, about 2 o'clock. Come on, guys, right? New Year's Day, a group of youth is going to meet with you, right? They did. We went, honestly, I, I didn't believe. I went because I said I'd go. And when we got there, they were there, and they wanted to hear about Jesus. So this is a picture of the guys who got saved that day. And then the guy in the back was walking by, and he couldn't pass it up. He sat down to see what was going on. What's this crazy gringo doing? And uh, he uh, couldn't pull himself away. He dread leaving three different times. He kept coming back and sitting back down, and he got saved that day also. So. So just a picture of some of the young ladies, and then Wilmer is in the background. He is doing phenomenal. He's growing like crazy. He's walking through discipleship with me. Literally, when Johnny and I go into the neighborhood, he goes into the neighborhood. So when we go share the gospel, he goes with us and shares the gospel. All right? He's going everywhere we go. Don't know what I was preaching that day, but they weren't real happy. <laughs> um. <laughs> you know, but uh, I'll, br I'll blame the translator, right? <laughs> but look, he's holding the Bible. All right? He didn't have one before. He has one now. He's holding Jesus in his hands, and he's learning who he is. So it's a this is uh, in Valiente also. On Fridays, Johnny and I hit the streets. Um, specifically targeting businesses. And so we'll walk business to business. We walk in. Who's the owner? I want to meet them because usually they're there. And then we ask them, share your vision that you have for your business in Valiente. And then we share with them the vision God's given us for Valiente. And we say, how can we partner? How can we work together? And I always ask the same question every time, and that is, if your heart stopped beating right now, are you 100% sure that you will go to heaven? We are seeing business owners come to Christ and say, how can we participate? How can we help? Oh, let me back up for one second. So this is a car wash. We went, we were driving past the car wash, and there was a big cluster of young men. So I said, let's go back. We went. All of these young men received Christ as their Savior, with the exception of the gringo in the middle and Wilmer on the right. That's the same young man I showed you earlier. He's there. He was part of it. He shared his testimony, right? So they've accepted Christ. The business owner has grown now to the point that on Tuesdays at 4 o'clock when we're there to do the Bible study, he shuts everything down. He won't let anybody wash their cars. He won't let anybody play pool. He won't let anybody buy anything from the store. It's time to hear the word. The barber shop right across the street, raining one day, 
we ducked into the barber shop for cover. Two guys in the chairs accepted Christ. The guy waiting to get his hair cut accepted Christ. The two barbers gave their life to Christ again because they hadn't been living it. And now the barber shop closes at 4 o'clock and they come over to the Bible study. Across the street's a cell phone repair store. He accepted Christ as his Savior. They close at 4 o'clock on Tuesdays. And they come to the Bible study. So it's really cool what God's doing in Valiente. Uh, Monte Plata. There's a baseball academy in Monte Plata. It is about an hour and a half away from where we live. We go there on Thursdays. There's 25 to 30 of the top prospects in the country there preparing for MLB. Okay? Uh, I th- what was it, five of them, Heather, a couple weeks ago? So five of them a couple weeks ago signed with MLB. All of them knew Christ as their Savior. Amen? They didn't before. They do now. Amen? And so we're the ones that are there as they train, we continue to go, pour into them, sharing the Word of God. Right now we're doing what I would call biblical foundations with them, stair-stepping them into the process of starting the relationship of discipleship. Right? So they're doing great, growing like crazy. Monte Cristi, God said, hey, go plant a church on the other side of the country. It's about 30 minutes from Haiti. We went in there, not knowing where he wanted the church planted. When we arrived, there were, there's 14 distinct neighborhoods. They call them barrios. But there's distinct neighborhoods, 14 of them. 13 of them have a work. They, they have a church. They have somebody who is working that area attempting to share Jesus. One of them didn't. Everyone was fired up. Yeah, that's got to be the spot. I was going, hang on, hit the brakes. Why? Why isn't there a church there? I mean, come on. You know, there's something oppressive there if there's 13 works around it and nothing happening there. And so we prayed and God started revealing what he wanted done. He, He put somebody in our path who accepted Christ as their Savior who lived in that area. We weren't even in the area yet. And he lived there. Um, that afternoon, we went and we walked in the area. And we were just walking the streets, and, you know, walking up to people saying, hey, what do you know about Jesus? Teach me. Tell me what you know about Jesus. And as we were doing that, we got to an intersection, and Samuel, one of our partners there, started singing praises to God. So we all, they started singing praises to God. You don't want to hear me do that in Spanish. And, uh, and so I went and got my cajon and the speaker. And we just started having a praise service, impromptu praise service. People started coming. It was really cool. And Samuel looked over his shoulder and said, preach. There's no translator. That's when you walk by faith. Um, Holy Spirit did amazing. And there was this man who gave his life to Christ. Tears rolling down his cheeks. So, sorry, let me digress. That's the mountain area in, Mont- in Monte Cristi. Hey, and on the right, the apartment we stayed in for all of this while we were there, that's the owner, and that's her receiving Christ. Amen? So the man on the left, he gave his life to Christ, tears streaming down his cheeks, on his knees in the middle of the road, giving his life to Christ. He gets up when we're done, and he says, come to my house. He wouldn't take no for an answer. So we follow him to his house. He wanted his wife to know that's her. She accepted Christ as her Savior. Their daughter lives next door. She accepted Christ as her Savior. Their granddaughters, 11 and 12, accepted Christ as their Savior. Whole family came to Christ. Amen? That's powerful. So the group decided that Heather and I should stay and start them in the process of discipleship. So we, Saturday night, poured into them some more. Sunday we went, that's her reading the Word of God on Sunday. Just having a good time. She's been around Christian music before, she, you know, but didn't have a real purpose to sing it. But she led the music that Sunday morning. It's really cool. It's really cool what God's doing. We are blessed beyond measure, richly blessed um, in so many ways. Um, as you heard, my daughter's at the house right now. She's just gathering her strength and her energy because J.J. is trying to take it all. Um, And so they are 
head deep in ministry with us. Right? It's a partnership. It's a team. It's just one of the coolest things I've ever been part of, getting to do it with my wife and our, my wife and our daughter and her husband. It's just amazing. But he is a huge blessing. Johnny is there every step of the way. He's bilingual. And he knows the culture. And it's just awesome getting to serve God there alongside with him. When I'm in the neighborhood, he's in the neighborhood. Okay, where I go, he goes. And it's just cool to watch God use him, work through him in helping me grow in the Dominican and showing me some of the things that I need to know in the Dominican. So he is a huge asset to us. Just a huge blessing. On the left, we were preaching in a church, different church in Monte Plata. And on the right, we were preparing baptism for 12 that day. 12, 12 people took the first step of obedience and baptism um, on that day. And that's him. They're getting the water bottles and preparing the baptistry for it. So. And that's him just giving it. He was excited because he didn't have a gringo in his way, right? So, <laughs> but he's a huge blessing. See, please continue to pray for us. We need your prayers. We need them. I'm, it's not icing on the cake. It's a need. We need it, okay? Prayer is important. We are in, this is, look, I was an MP for six years. I was a police officer for six years. I've done firefighting. I was a painter apprentice with this guy. Right here, HB. I've done some, you name it. I've tried it, did it, had the T-shirt, but wasn't any good at it. Um, but done a lot of things. This is the hardest thing we've ever done in our life. It is not easy. We need your prayers. So that's the best way you can help us. Pray for supernatural wisdom and discernment. Okay? And then I would say favor also. All right? And so thank you for your love, your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your fiscal support, your fine, all of it, your prayers, all of it. Thanks for loving us. Thank you, Lee. Be praying for them. They're headed to Arizona tomorrow uh, to meet their newest grandson, Griffin, uh, who was born last week. So very, very exciting. All right, well, let's jump into the word today. Our topic is a worthy walk. A worthy walk. And go to Ephesians chapter 4. For those of you in our Young families class, if you were in class last week, you're going to get a double dose because I just couldn't get away from this passage. Ephesians chapter 4. And Paul says here, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Let's go to the throne together and pray once again. Father, I thank you so much that we can be in your presence, that we can fellowship around your word. I'm thankful that you've preserved this book for us and that it's still just as powerful and alive today as when you first penned it through your servants. And we just praise you and ask that Jesus, your name, be lifted up and glorified in this place, that you would stir our hearts and that we would be changed because we've been with you. And I pray this in your name. Amen. So a worthy walk. A worthy walk. Walk worthy. Paul used this phrase three different times in his writings. Walk worthy of God, he says in 1 Thessalonians Chapter 2, that's a walk that glorifies God, a walk that understands our value to him, a walk that receives his word and that follows it. In Colossians, he used the phrase, walk worthy of the Lord. 
That's a walk that backs up your talk. A fruitful walk that shows how worthy and gracious and loving he is to you. It's a moment-by-moment walk of intimate fellowship with Jesus and a willingness to know him and his power and even the fellowship of his sufferings. And then he says, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called here in our passage today. And this is a walk that's characterized by Christ-like character. It's a walk that daily matches the gospel message. A walk that's known by humility and patience and love and unity. So in our time today, we're just going to break down these three verses. Uh, Just have a little time of fun in God's word, more of a teaching type of message. Um, We're just going to break it down and uh, walk through it. How does God want us to walk worthy? So again, verse 1 says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. I therefore, Paul writes, it's the hinge of Ephesians, this word, therefore. Chapters 1 through 3, he covers how amazing our God is. Chapters 4 through 6, he covers our response to this great Lord that we have and what we should be doing with our lives. And this word, therefore, is right in the middle of it all. Just the hinge of how great God is and what we should be doing with that knowledge. Think about our Lord for a moment. We have redemption Through his blood, chapter 1 tells us, and the forgiveness of sins. We have been given an inheritance. We have the Holy Spirit. We're sealed unto the day of redemption. We've been brought from death to life, made alive through Christ. We've been saved by grace through faith. We've been made fellow citizens with the saints And the household of God. We became fellow heirs with the Jews. He tore down that wall that was between us. And made it possible for us to have an inheritance with him. That's what he talks about in those first three chapters. You think about all that Jesus has done for you. And if you've been a Christian for any length of time, it's very easy to just gloss right over that because you know it. And you need to really just camp out there sometimes and remember all that he's done for you. Woe woe to me if every day I just don't stop and say thank you for saving my soul because I wasn't deserving of salvation. I wasn't deserving of forgiveness. I need to camp there a whole lot more than I do. Not just gloss over that. When you read that, when you're doing your own personal time, really just stop and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. What a Savior we have. You know what? If you can't get excited about what Jesus has done, Today's a day, a good day to give your life to him. Or maybe just to come back to him, right? Relish again in his greatness. He died for you. He rose again. He's coming again. Salvation is through him alone. Turn from your way and give your life to him. I promise you'll never be the same. That's what he covers in chapters 1 through 3. Pretty amazing stuff. After this, therefore, he goes into a practical walk of faith. What we should do in response to this great Savior and all that he has done. Our care for others, the spiritual gifts that we have, our role in the church, what, how husbands and wives should function, masters, servants, parents, children, spiritual warfare with the armor of God. So much in this book. I challenge you to study this book. It'll, it'll mess you up in a good way, right? He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. The prisoner, not of Rome, where he was at, but the prisoner of the Lord. 
he calls himself. Writing from a Roman prison, but he calls himself the Lord's prisoner. Pretty amazing. Even in prison, he's thinking of the Lord. He's thinking of the churches. In fact, he wrote four different letters to the churches, to people from prison. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. They're called the prison letters or prison epistles. And they're some of the most encouraging and liberating things you will ever read written from a man in prison. Pretty amazing. I beseech you, he says. I beseech you. I exhort you. I encourage you. I want you to know there's a sense of urgency to what I'm telling you. The word literally, literally means I'm going to come alongside you as I exhort you. Interesting. I'm not a Greek scholar by any means. The word for beseech in the Greek is parakaleo which is the root word for parakletos, which is translated comforter by Jesus, the Holy Spirit. The root word for comforter is beseech. They don't mean the same thing, but they both have the connotation of coming alongside you as you are walking your walk. Aren't you glad you got the Holy Spirit to walk with you every single day? And Paul's saying, I beseech you, I'm going to give you some instruction, but I'm going to do whatever I can to walk beside you while I'm doing it. I'm going to come right alongside you. And hey, for any of you old KCBT people, that's where they got the word paraclete manner. All right, just throwing that out there. <clears throat> Paul is saying, in light of all that Christ has done for you, this is how you should live. Walking worthy of the calling that you have on your life. Christians, you represent Jesus to your spouse, your children, your family, your friends, your community, your co-workers, and those here at church. Paul is saying it's an urgent matter. The time is short. I've got something you really got to get a hold of. Walk worthy of this calling that you have on your life. Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. There's got to be a worthy response to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's still the power of God unto salvation today. It still should be powerful even if you've been a Christian for a long time and believe it. It's still just as powerful, but it deserves a worthy response. You've been called by God to a lifestyle that follows the footsteps of Jesus. And we've got to walk deserving of this calling that God has on our lives. So let's take a look. Five specific manifestations of this worthy walk. I'll read for you verses 2 and 3 again. It says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering." Forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. He gives us five things, and we're just going to walk our way through these five things. If you're taking notes, lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity. And think about it this way, husbands, wives, parents, pastors, teachers, coaches, Leaders, employees, employers, students, this is all for you. Church members, this is for you. Just let the word just penetrate into you today, into your hearts and into your minds, and let Jesus peel back some of those layers that maybe you like to hold on to. Let him really get in there and stir you just a little bit. There are some things he may want you to lay down today, and there are some things he may want you to pick up today, Right? Let's get into the study. The first one here is lowliness. Now, Tyler, my son-in-law there, have you ever just thought, you know, I just want to be a lowly man? Probably not, you know. I mean, that's not like our goal in life. Yeah, I'm, I'm just getting up today. I'm just going to be a lowly man. I mean, you ever hear anybody say that? No. Right. Well, he's saying, hey, this first characteristic I want you to have is lowliness. Lowliness, humility, 
Loneliness of mind in other parts of Scripture, it says. Humbleness of mind in other parts of Scripture. 1 Peter 5, 5 tells us we should be clothed with humility. When I was wondering what I should wear today, I thought, man, I could go with the untuck it style, like pastor. I'm not really, I'm not really tall, and I don't have the cool hair. And Teresa's like, well, you're really kind of a sweater vest kind of guy. I was like, whatever that means, let's go with that. <laughs> when you get up in the morning tomorrow, think about this. God wants you to be clothed with humility. Clothed with humility. That's not something we really strive for very often, is it? It's not really celebrated in our world today. Until something special happens, someone saves a child and you know, they, don't, they don't want a lot of credit for it. A celebrity, uh, uh, an athlete, or, or an entertainer, you know, they, they kind of, some of them want to stay in the background. I loved watching Cooper, Cooper Cup, by the way, go Chiefs. Uh, Cooper Cup, uh, last week, the MVP of the Super Bowl, he gave all the glory to the Lord, to his family, to his teammates, to his coaches, to the support. He's like, I really don't deserve this I like to see that you know from someone that's being clothed with humility God gives grace to the humble right in Proverbs 138 6 talks about how though the Lord be high yet he has respect to the lowly Proverbs 3 surely he scorneth the scorners but he giveth grace unto the lowly Jesus even said of himself, Matthew 11, I am meek and lowly of heart. Remember that old song? There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. The lowly Jesus. I am meek and lowly of heart. In Philippians 2, let's turn over there. You're just a couple of pages away. Philippians chapter 2. This beautiful passage, we, we even read uh, uh, from it during our worship service uh, earlier. In Philippians chapter 2, and I'll just start in verse 1 and just read the first few verses. It says, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort in love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And then in verse 3, he says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. And then he goes on in this passage, not coincidentally, he just talks about lowliness of mind. And then he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What mind? This lowliness of mind. This humility of spirit. This meekness that our Savior had, let that kind of mind be in you. This willingness to serve, this willingness to lay your life down. That's lowliness. That's lowliness. So let me challenge you. I will challenge you with each one of these. Husbands and wives, are you clothed in humility? Parents, do your children know you as a mom or dad of pride or a mom or dad of humility? Church members, students, employees, the light of Christ is shown through a humble, lowly spirit. Do others see that in you? Pastors, leaders, teachers, coaches, how about you? Is your walk, is it a worthy walk that's known by the manifestation of lowliness? Something for us all to ponder there. Amen. Let's move to the second one. Meekness. All these strong characteristics, right? Meekness, not easily provoked. Strength under control. A mild temper. It's endurance for a purpose. It's generous in forgiving. It's the ability to restrain even when knowing that you could win a battle. Because you know there's a bigger victory ahead. It's the opposite of a brawler. 
an opposite of a devil's advocate, an opposite of a button pusher, right? Meek, a meek person. Meekness is not weakness. It's strength under control. Psalm 147, 6 says, the Lord will lift up the meek. Jesus said, blessed are the meek in the Beatitudes. Matthew 11, again, the one from the slide before, Jesus said, I am meek and lowly of heart. And in Galatians 6, Paul, who had this huge personality, could be harsh at times. He said, I'm writing to you, Galatians, in the meekness and gentleness of Christ. You know, the cross at Calvary required meekness. For him to hang on the cross for our sins and have them mock him and have them defame his name and have them curse at him with him knowing he was the savior of the world took meekness. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. Amen. That's our great Savior. What did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's meekness. That's meekness. What a savior. What a savior. You know, your ability to win a futile argument is not a characteristic of a worthy walk. You know, some people are really good at at debate and winning arguments and everything. But when you win an argument, do you really win anything? You normally both lose, right? Because someone's either irritated that they couldn't win or mad at you for pushing their buttons. I mean, there's no winner right? There's bigger victories ahead. That's why Jesus hung on the cross and endured all of that because he knew there was a bigger victory ahead. And that's how we should live. A bigger victory is ahead for us. So let me challenge you. Husbands and wives, how's your meekness? Are you more worried about winning arguments or winning the heart of your spouse? Parents, your children are going to make a lot of mistakes. What's up, girl? See you over there. Picasso on the, you know, markers on the walls and stuff. I still love her, though. She's my girl, right? That wasn't you? Oh, she, look at that. Oh, that wasn't me, Dad. That was, that was Tab. Uh, I'm a grandpa. She's a mom, and she's still, she's still pointing fingers at her sister. Oh, that's good. Parents, your children are going to make some mistakes, you know, and, and discipline is part of being a parent. Do your children know you as the punisher? Or do they know you as somebody that lovingly carries out discipline? Got to have a heart of meekness. Students and employees and church members, the light of Christ is shown through someone that's under the control of the Spirit of God, even during tough times. Having this meekness, knowing that a bigger victory is ahead. Can this be said of you? And then pastors and leaders and coaches and teachers, do you have the right balance of meekness? Do you have that balance in your life? Got to have truth, but you also got to have grace, right? The next one, long-suffering. Long-suffering, extreme patience, steadfast endurance, suffering long, slowness in avenging wrongs, not losing heart, not easily provoked. It's much deeper than just the word patience. Proverbs 16 tells us a man that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that charity suffers long. Charity suffers Long. It requires endurance, not losing heart, not giving in when times are tough. Extreme patience. Waiting and enduring and suffering is not really high on our list of priorities, is it? But if we're quick to negatively react 
to get angry easily or we're consistently impatient, we got to lay some things down at the foot of the cross. We really do because that's not what we're supposed to be known for. We're supposed to be known for the love that we have. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another, Jesus said. Amen. We're close. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, I love this verse. If you're still out there not convinced that you should be long-suffering, let's read this verse together. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. And it says here, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Our Lord is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. I'm so glad he is a long-suffering Lord. And it doesn't even stop after we're Christians. He continues to be long-suffering. We are not perfect. We stumble and we fall often. Sometimes deliberately we just pursue things that we should not. And it ends up hurting us, giving us harm. But what does our God do? He says, I'm right here. Let me help you back up. Let me clean you off. I just want to walk with you. I, I just want you to be with me. And we, and we do that for a little while, and, and then we're like, but that looks so good over there. And, and we pursue something again, and we stumble, and we fall. But yet there he is again saying, I'm right here. I just want to walk with you. L let me help you back up. Let me clean you back off. I love you so much. I, I just, I just want to walk with you. I've got so much for you if you'll just stay in my presence and walk with me. That's long-suffering, isn't it? And we need more Christians that are long-suffering that'll say, hey, your past is the past. I got a past too. Let's get up and let's walk together. Let's come alongside one another and get the work done for the Lord. And let's help each other. Let's hone one another. Let's be there for one another. Let's support one another. That's long-suffering, amen? Long-suffering. I love this. In Hebrews chapter 12, we, we read the first two verses a lot how... We've got this great, you know, great Savior, and, and we need to lay aside weight. We need to lay aside sin and, and look to him, the author and finisher of our faith. And then it says in verse 3, Consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. He went through so much for us. Consider him. You know, People aren't always going to like the fact that you're a Christian. People aren't always going to like the fact that you've taken a stand for the Lord. You don't have to be offensive as the messenger, but the truth will offend. The truth does offend, and people don't like that sometimes. Consider what he went through, the long-suffering that he went through, so that you don't become weary, so that you don't become faint. Consider what he did, and he has the power in you for you to be a long-suffering Christian. Amen? Consider him. Consider him. So let me challenge you, husbands and wives, your spouse is going to mess up some. I hate to tell you that. Bobby said, yeah, baby. I don't know, Becky, you better watch out. <laughs> Becky says, right on. <laughs> They're going to irritate you sometimes. They're going to lay you down sometimes and not meet your expectations. How is your long-suffering? Are you patient with them? Are you enduring? Parents, like I said earlier, your children are going to mess up. Sometimes they're going to get on your last nerve, right? Somebody said, that's true. <laughs> You're going to respond in anger? Or are you going to respond with long-suffering? Again, hey, you've got to have discipline. You've got to have those tough conversations. You've got to make sure that there's order in the house. But you've got to do it with long-suffering. You've got to do it with the love of God. When your patience wears thin, and it will, you've got to ask God for just a little bit more, right? Just a little bit more. 
Students and church members, employees, employers, the light of Christ is shown through extreme patience and steadfast endurance, this long suffering. How brightly does your light shine with those around you? And then I don't want to leave out the pastors, leaders, coaches, and teachers. God wants to use some of the worst people, some of the least likely people of the bunch that you lead. He wants to use them. You've got to be steadfast. You've got to suffer long for them if necessary. They are worth it. A 20-year-old break dancer named Lee Carter stood before you today. Not a lot of people would have put a lot of faith in a 20-year-old break dancer. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating the fact he was a break dancer. He'll tell you, I'd have never dreamed that God would have me do what I'm doing now. He'd never dreamed that he had a woman that would walk beside him and a son-in-law that, that's a big fella, and a daughter that's just right alongside him. That's what God does. So those, so those that are in your ministries, those people that you have influence on, you got to be patient with them. you got to be long-suffering with them. I mean, Lee, Lee leaned over to me. <laughs> I love this. Two of the girls singing on stage today were in his children's group years ago. He's like, what a blessing. You never know. Those people that seem like they're the least or the worst behaved, man, if you'll just love them, you never know what God will do. Amen? Amen. I'm just so thankful for God's long suffering to me. I mean, I was a pastor's kid and I was terrible. Whew. These people are worth it. <laughs> Number four. <laughs> Forbearing one another in love. Allowing for their faults. Looking past their shortcomings. Looking past their mistakes and even their sin. Colossians 3, 12 through 15 is a beautiful parallel passage uh, to this one we're studying today. And it talks about forbearing one another and forgiving one another because Christ forgave you forbearing one another Romans 15 talks about how the strong should bear the burdens of the weak and I love this quote from Henry Ward Beecher in the 1800s every man should keep a fair sized cemetery in which to bury the faults of his friends that's pretty deep you know the people around us have faults but so do you Bury them false. Bury them false, right? I love that quote. Every man should keep a fair-sized cemetery in which to bury the faults of his friends. Forbear one another in love. In love. Look past those mistakes, those shortcomings. Husbands and wives. Every time I say that, I see people like, ah, kind of cringe, right? The faults of your spouse are obvious. You see them every day, but so are yours, right? So are yours. Look past those shortcomings. God wants you to be a team that, that raises warriors for the Lord, that, that ministers for the Lord, that makes an impact on the community. you got to do it together. I say this to my people in premarital counseling. The enemy, every time he sees a good Christian marriage, sees Jesus and the church, and he hates it. And so he does whatever he can to destroy it. And that's why we've got to work so hard to be diligent. We're representing Jesus and the church and our marriage to our kids and to those around us and to other marriages. And we've got to work so hard at it. And if you had a failed marriage and you're married again, don't worry about the last one. Worry about this one. Live like Jesus and the church, the relationship that he has with us. Amen. Are you with me? Husbands and wives, come on, you can do that. Parents, your children, like I said, they're going to break things. They're going to mess some things up. They're going to get into a heap of trouble, but they need you to come alongside them. Beseech them sometimes, right? Correct them, help them, teach them, give them the direction they need, but it's got to be done in love because you love them so much. Students and employees and church members, employers, the light of Christ is shown through forgiveness. Through looking past the faults of others. 
I have a file cabinet on somebody, and you bring stuff back up over and over and over again. Kick that thing to the curb. Bury it, right? Pastors, leaders, coaches, teachers, too many Christians are known for their abrasiveness and their harshness and their contention and even their arrogance. We've got to be known by the love that we have, the humility that we have, the gentleness that we have, the patience that we have. If we really want to be like Jesus, that's what we've got to be known for. The proper balance of grace and truth, like I said earlier, the proper balance of strength and compassion. Then one more for today. <clears throat> Number five, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Endeavor, it's a lot of work. It's hard work. It's a diligent pursuit of unity. I mean, keeping unity is hard, right? It's a bold pursuit of unity we've got to have. And that word endeavor, I love it. In, in 2 Timothy 2.15, the word study, the same Greek word as endeavoring. You know, it takes a lot of work to study to be approved of God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It takes a lot of work to do that. It also takes a lot of work to keep this unity, to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Psalm 133, 1 says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Unity. Our enemy wants to divide and confuse and keep you isolated that's what he tries to do because he knows how much power there is in unity how much power there is in being together in community unity takes a lot of work it takes a lot of work we've got a shared mission we've got to work together to accomplish it and anything that gets in the way we've got to we've got to put it aside and work for unity work for unity the bond of peace. I like to think of this as this ligament that holds, holds everything together is this bond of peace. And he is our peace, the scripture tells us. He has a peace that passes all understanding, Philippians 4. He's not the author of confusion, but he's the author of peace, 1 Corinthians 14. The bond of peace. Jesus even said, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. So I'll challenge you again, husbands and wives. When the storms of life come, do you strive for peace? Do you strive for peace? Does your spouse know you as a peacemaker? Parents, do you bring calm when your children have fears? Do you bring peace to them? The light of Christ for our students, our employees, our church members, the light of Christ is shown in the peace that you sow. How much peace and unity are you going to reap if you're sowing peace? And then pastors, teachers, coaches, leaders, do people dread to have you show up? Oh man, here we go again. Or are they glad that peace has arrived? We need to be men and women of peace. You heard Lee talking about when they go to a new place, they try to find the man, the person of peace. Because everyone in the community respects that person already. And if they can win that person, they can impact the whole community. Amazing, amazing. So you got five things there. So let me close with the challenge. Will you walk worthy of the calling that God has given you? And first, let me address those of you that are maybe considering following Jesus. He loved you enough to take your place. He paid the penalty for your sin by his death on the cross, but then he rose again. In fact, it was 500 or more people witnessed his, him after his resurrection. He really did raise from the dead. That's why we stand here. That's why we do what we do. He ascended to heaven and promised to return for those that choose to follow him. So I beseech you, 
Put your faith and trust in him today. He's just a prayer away. And there'll be people here at the, at the close of our service if you really want to know more to help you. And then for our members here, if we were to continue on into chapter 4 and chapter 5 and chapter 6, we would see Paul has a re, this requirement of a worthy walk is just the starting point. These are the characteristics you have. And then he continues talking about the gifts and talents and abilities that you have in this chapter. How it plays out in your role in the church. These five manifestations have got to be evident in us. So I challenge you. It's time to walk worthy of your calling. You've all been called to do something. Regardless of what you're title is you've all been called to do something it's time to get involved it's time to walk worthy of your calling you've been blessed with gifts and talents and abilities to help this church body right now right here right now so do something with them husbands and wives it's time to work together to get the work of the lord done can't do that fighting amongst yourselves and if you struggle like I said earlier find another couple to come alongside you that you can live life with and learn from and parents your children need you to walk worthy of your calling God has given you precious gifts in these children that you have future warriors for the kingdom and their future, their endeavors that they have out there are largely hinge on how you live every single day. Students, employees, employers, church members, they are lost and broken around you every single day. They need to see worthy walking Christians show, showing the light of Jesus to them. They need to see that. I can't leave out the pastors, leaders, coaches, teachers. Those in your care need strong but humble leaders. They need patient and loving leaders that make the hard decisions but that walk right alongside them. They need you, so walk worthy of your calling. Remember this one final thought. If you know Jesus, you've been brought from death to life brought from death to life and you've been given gifts from him the rest of this chapter tells us about that you have his resurrection power flowing through your veins you can do all things through christ which strengthens you so now is the time to get after it let's do it together bow your heads